Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today and uh, I thank Minister Creighton for the invitation to uh, address this meeting. I want to offer a personal reflection so it's not the grainy detail of the dossier. I'm freed from the burden of office so I may say things with some directness but not too much. And like Minister Vesna Pusic has remarked, as someone who was in Thessaloniki 10 years ago, I'm conscious that I myself, of course, am 10 years older, as well as the 10 years of uh, variable progress. Sir Isaiah Berlin, the great British historian, defined history not as linear, but as geological. To understand what was on the surface required one, in his view, to dig deep to see what lay beneath. There are few places in the world where the wisdom of this observation is as manifest as in the Balkans. Geologically, it is a fracture zone where the Earth's tectonic plates have produced earthquakes devastating and small. Historically, it was the front line and therefore the fault line at the edge of empires, among them the Habsburg and the Ottoman. It was the borderland where Western Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, Muslim and Jew coexisted side by side, at peace and not, over time. After World War II, Tito's weighty presence and a delicate rotating balance of power contained these various energies in the form of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. When Tito died in 1980, the lid began to lift from the constitutional and institutional containment vessel that was the former Yugoslavia, as ethnic and nationalist tensions reasserted themselves. In 1989, following a period of tension in Kosovo, Slobodan Milosevic, delivered the epoch-defining speech at Kosovo Polja, 500 years after the Battle of Kosovo of 1389, through which Serbian defeat at the hands of the Ottomans entered Serbian legend and historical consciousness. His focus on a greater Serbia captured the zeitgeist of burgeoning regional nationalisms. The Serbs were not alone in this perspective. The die was cast Dark and pent-up energies were released. By 1991, Yugoslavia disintegrated and descended into a vicious conflict that introduced to many of us new and frightful concepts such as ethnic cleansing and meaningless, if well-intentioned ones, such as UN safe havens. European integration was proceeding apace. The Berlin Wall collapsed. Germany was reunified the Soviet Union imploded. The Treaty on European Union set out ambitious new policy targets, included the emerging field of common foreign and security policy. The pace of events was palpable, but the disintegration of Yugoslavia was so vicious, such an affront to a common presumption then in the EU that war in Europe was a thing of the past, that inevitably it came to dominate attention. In truth, it cruelly exposed the gap between the EU's policy pretensions and aspirations on common security policy and its lack of capacity to act. Summit meeting conclusions, Foreign Affairs Council statements and European Parliament resolutions came thick and fast, but no amount of resolutions could substitute a resolve and a capacity to act. Deeds counted for more than words. The EU's mountain of resolutions was in inverse proportion to the ability to act. As a deputy in the European Parliament then, I can still recall the sense of the EU's impotence that I was witnessing and participating in, however minor my then role. To this day, when I hear or read the name of Srebrenica, and recall the vile massacre of the summer of 1995, I still feel the sense of shame and troubled conscience that I then felt 
most of two decades ago. For much of that period, I scrambled personally to try to understand this region, of which before I must admit I had known so little. Journalism was good on events as they unfolded, but weak on perspective. Conventional histories that I read left me looking for something deeper. For me, it was when I began reading the works of Ivo Andrich, and in particular The Bridge Over the Drina, published 50 years before I first read it, and a work whose essence I found almost prophetic in its outlook, that I began in some way to comprehend something of the depths and energies beneath the surface that I was witnessing. I recall in particular his chillingly accurate phrase written in 1945, and I quote, of hurricanes of hatred awaiting their hour of expression, end quote. So it was when I came to lead the Liberal Group in the European Parliament, and eventually when I had the privilege to be its president, that I could approach the new post-conflict politics of the region, fortified by modest understanding and the duty of an informed and bruised conscience to seek to offer the comfort of hope in a common European perspective. This is to convey to you briefly my journey to Thessaloniki 10 years ago. Since the US brokered Dayton peace accords at the end of 1995, the region began the long journey to normalization. When the conflict in Kosovo flared up in 1998 and images of streams of refugees filled our television screens, we were jolted into the realisation that Dayton's peace was a fragile flower that needed more careful tending. Late but eventually determined US-led NATO intervention helped to resolve the conflict, whose legacy effects have just so recently achieved the new milestone of which many have spoken with the EU-brokered agreement between Serbia and Kosovo which is indeed something of enormous uh, significance. Now, of course, as with all agreements, the challenge is for implementation. In 2001, Macedonia, the former, Republic, uh, of, uh, former Yugoslav Republic of, also established beyond doubt that the regional genie of ethnic conflict was by no means back in the bottle. But calamity was averted by one of the CFSP's most notable early successes. Yet there was an overwhelming sense that more needed to be done. Entered the Greek president of the e presidency of the EU and the Thessaloniki summit of 10 years ago. 2003 was a year of definition for the negotiation on EU enlargement. The accession treaties of the then 10 acceding states had been signed in Athens in April. Membership beckoned to be formalised here in Phoenix Park uh, under the Irish Presidency on the 1st of May of 2004. But in many respects, 2003 was also the year of the Western Balkans. As European Parliament President, I attended the European Council meeting in Thessaloniki. I might add the last to be held outside Brussels. Ever since, they've only been held, uh, as you know, in Brussels. This immediately was followed on the 21st of June of that year by the European Union West Balkan Summit. The European Parliament was resolved not just to be associated with this stress initiative, but actively to contribute to the realisation of its goals. At the end of September that year, 2003, I made one of the most intense visits of my European Parliament presidency to the region, visiting and addressing the parliaments in Croatia, Serbia, Macedonia, Albania and Bosnia, meeting the leaders of Montenegro while in Belgrade and of Kosovo in the course of a visit to Pristina. The message was one of engagement but differentiation. That still holds. Of prospects but not of precise timetables. That still holds. Of unresolved issues, of course of which many. Of refugee return of the fight against crime and corruption, of the need for transformation and modernization, of the need for strong institutions more than strong men. And I felt obliged in one or two parliaments to emphasize that point. And I do mean men, not women. 
uh, as one will know from the, from the region. And of course, of the unresolved status issues, particularly in Kosovo and Bosnia. I recall with great clarity how each capital spoke with some enthusiasm at that time for enhanced links with Brussels and the EU, but were more circumspect about links regionally and closer to home, as has indeed been amply remarked earlier. President Tricoski of Macedonia, I must say, whose death in that uh, air crash was deeply tragic, not just for his person and family, but I actually think for his country. He was such a towering figure and played such a role uh, in his brief period in office. Uh, President Tchaikovsky, President uh, Marovic, then of, uh, the President of the EU, short-lived, inspired Serbia and Montenegro, because of course the two had their velvet divorce at the earliest available opportunity, and President Mesic of Croatia were all invited to address the European Parliament. The speaker of all the region, speakers of the regional parliaments were associated as observers at my initiative with the work of their counterparts from the then accession states. Regional reintegration, though a major theme of the dialogue, after such conflict, as has been remarked by all the speakers today, could not be imposed from the outside. It fell to the region in itself, encouraged by the European Union, to find the functional expression. The experience of Europe's own integration reveals the need for true reconciliation to be based on conviction. It cannot be imposed, as we know, in Western Europe. Pax Americana assured Europe's post-war peace. In Western Europe, the perceived common and external threat of the Soviet Union bound nations more closely together. But the animation for true reconciliation had come from within. While Schumann's famous declaration of 9th May 1950 is often recalled for its institutional and foundational quality. It is his use of the phrase about creative reconciliation, which always has struck for me the most important note. This was the soul that animated the structures of which he spoke. It was a gift that only Europeans could give to themselves, and so it is true for regional reconciliation in the Western Balkans. To conclude, Mr Chairman, since then, and it's not the purpose of my brief intervention, as I said, to assess the grainy detail of the progress. It is greatly to be celebrated that Croatia stands on the threshold of full membership in a few short weeks. The multiple crises of recent years, however, have left the European Union exhausted by deep introspection. And we must remember that the world and our near neighbours and their needs and our shared interests cannot be put on artificial hold while we fix Europe's plumbing. The spirit of Thessaloniki has yielded fruit, but the full harvest is not yet gathered. I'm deeply troubled personally that our friends in Macedonia still await their full invitation to proceed to their place at the table. It is high time this issue over name was resolved. Not to do so on its own doorstep is an unhappy reminder for the EU of the policy impotence to which I earlier referred. Lastly, Chairman, the comatose state of affairs in Bosnia is a source of deep concern. Ten years on from Thessaloniki, it teaches that determined effort can yield positive outcome. More needs to be done with and for Bosnia. I talk here not as an imposition, but as an imperative. Thank you.